Hello, everyone. Welcome to Examining Evolution. I'm here with Peter, who is an outstanding student and um, is going to talk to us today about hominin fossils and some various things related to human evolution. And of course, we are. this channel is about examining evolution, and we want to discover what is really the truth. Is there this progression of uh, human ancestry as so often is presented. And Peter has a different perspective on that. Peter is coming from a creationist perspective. And I'm just going to let Peter, can you tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Certainly. Yeah. Thank you for having me on today, Rebecca. It's great mm -hmm. to be with you. Yeah. So my name is Peter and I uh, am, have been studying hominid fossils for several years. I've been working with Dr. Todd Wood of the Core Academy of Science, and I had the opportunity to be their Sanders Scholar of this year. So he and I have been working together, and we've published one paper so far and hope to do several more together. And I'm a big collector of rocks and fossils and enjoy studying hominid fossils. And that's uh, somewhat of my interest. And I am a young Earth creationist, as you are, Rebecca. Wow, very cool. What's a Sanders Scholar? So it's through the Core Academy of Science. They give a certain amount of money towards a particular research project. So mm -hmm. uh, coming up in March, I'm going to be traveling to Southern Tennessee to go to Southern Adventist University and uh, study some skeletons there. And then hopefully this summer, I have another research trip I'll be going on as well with Dr. Wood. So. Very good. And Peter has a YouTube channel um, called Paleo Logos. And so I put the link up there in the chat. You guys, please subscribe to him. And um, let's get started. What are you going to talk to us about? Yes, Let's thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so today we're going to be talking a little bit about hominin fossils and how exactly they fit into our understanding of creation. So maybe we'll begin here by jumping in and kind of looking at what we have as the fossils and kind of the dating of those fossils. And then we'll kind of get into exactly what the Bible says concerning human origins and how that plays into how creationists have thought of these fossils over the centuries. So uh, if you'd like to share this screen now here, that would be great. Uh, yeah, so uh, a biblical view of hominid fossils. Well, first of all, this is the fossil record. And uh, you can see here we have tons of different uh, fossil skulls that we found, tons of different species that have been named. And basically right here we see all these skulls placed in an order. At the bottom we have uh, 7 million years ago all the way to what is the present. Now, as a creationist, I obviously don't accept those dates, right? Um, but I think possibly that relative dating could be correct. And so in some sense, it can be helpful to use these dates as relative dating. I'm more comfortable with like using, um, for example, index fossils and things like that to date uh, fossils. But here we have kind of the general order of the fossil record. So down here at the bottom, we have this creature called Sahelanthropus tachadinensis. It had a very small brain, and it appears to have been walking upright. And then we have Artipithecus ramidus. There's a kind of a very fragmentary skeleton from Ethiopia. And then we have up here this group that is probably the best known of these apes called Australopithecus. And it's this genus that's very diverse, has all these different types of uh, creatures. And then as we get closer to modern time, we have the humans here. So that's kind of the general order of the fossil record. And from a materialistic, naturalistic point of view, you can understand why um, evolutionists would perhaps think that humans evolved from these creatures. Because we have down here these creatures that are um, partly uh, bipedal, and then as we get to the surface or closer to the present day, uh, they become more bipedal and less climbing in the trees, and then we end up with humans. And so that's kind of the general trend of uh, the evolutionary history of humans from an evolutionist point of view. 
Mm -hmm. So this is somewhat controversial. Uh, however, what I just mentioned about some of these creatures being bipedal, because that's uh, some creationists are very against that, but I'm going to show you a little bit about some of these fossils. So first of all, biped, quadruped, uh, you can see here by ped, ped, it comes from the word in Latin for foot. So humans are bipeds because we walk on two feet. Chimpanzees walk on four feet. Uh, some people have brought up, you know, there's some chimpanzees and gorillas at zoos that walk on two feet, but that is, uh, called, uh, quadrupedal still because they're not habitually bipedal. They don't walk around like that all the time, right? Mm -hmm. So this is human chimpanzee. And we can tell this when we look at, for example, their skull. This is one feature of uh, these creatures that shows us whether they were quadrupedal or bipedal. And this is called the foramen magnum. If you want to take uh, the slide down, Rebecca, uh, I'll uh, sh show you over my camera here. Let's see here. I've got here the skull of a chimpanzee here. And then this is a human skull right here. Okay. And look at them. You can see we have this hole on the bottom right here. And that's mm -hmm. the foramen magnum. It's, it's this little place in the bottom of your skull where your skull connects to the spinal cord. And it's placed differently in chimpanzees and in humans. So in humans, it's like right there in the middle of the skull. And in chimpanzees, it's uh, further towards the bottom of the skull. You can kind of see there. And mm -hmm. that's an important difference because depending on how a creature is walking, it needs its head oriented a certain way. And so that hole allows for your head to be oriented in different ways. And um, so we'll look at some fossils here and you'll see that, interestingly, some creatures which are not human have their head oriented in such a way that it appears that they were upright walkers as well. Mm. And you said that's controversial among creationists. Um, can you explain why that's a big deal to some creationists and yeah, why it's so, not a big deal to you? Certainly. Yeah, that's a great question. So many creationists over time have thought that the Australopithecines were not bipedal. One of the biggest proponents of that idea was the Creation Museum and the Answers in Genesis organization, right? They have in their uh, museum a model of Lucy walking on her knuckles. Well, it's true that Lucy did have some features of her knuckles that she shares in common with modern day uh, gorillas and creatures that walk on their knuckles. But there's also lots of features that uh, show that it was very similar to uh, a a human in terms of how it walked. Not exactly like a human, but somewhat similar. And over time, kind of what developed is creationists thought that if we actually had in the fossil record uh, bipedal creatures that were not human, that that would somehow automatically prove evolution. And so it became the the idea that all these creationists had to disprove the idea that these creatures are walking upright. Well, that has continued until the present, and a lot of creationist organizations like ICR, CMI, Answers in Genesis today are still uh, arguing that these creatures were not upright. And really, all of that idea stemmed from this debate within the evolutionary community. Um, back in the 1900s, um, there was a debate among evolutionists. And there was a school, I believe it's called the Stony Brook School of Thought, which argued that these creatures were not walking upright. And over time, kind of that idea phased out. And basically, everybody today is on the same side that these creatures were walking upright. So among creationists still today, it's a very common idea to believe that these were walking upright. And I believe to the contrary, as I said. And I, I think that... Um, Saying that these creatures weren't walk weren't walking upright isn't fundamental to our view, right? The Bible doesn't say that the Australopithecines didn't walk upright; it never mentions them, right? So I think there's been a kind of false conflation there that if we would find these creatures walking upright, that would prove evolution is true, which I don't mm -hmm. think is the case, and that's why I am comfortable with saying that. And part of why I try to tell people about that is because I think talking about the truth matters and we don't want to 
uh, be spreading something that isn't true, right? So that's part of kind of why I like to talk about that particular subject. Now, do you think there's a deliberate deception going on there? Or is it more just, um, you know, an innocent error? Ooh. Oh, Too boy. tough right now? You want to skip that? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to say both. Okay. Um, there, there are certain elements, I think, which are, are somewhat intentional. Uh, mm -hmm. Certain organizations have, like, produce statements such as, um, well, they, there's certain organizations that talk about, for example, reconstructions of the Australopithecines. And they say, you know, evolutionists are making stuff up about them. And they'll say things like, no hand and foot bones of Lucy were discovered, which it's, it's untrue. I have a cast of Lucy right here and both hands of the hand or both bones of the hand and the foot were both recovered. Uh, so there's kind of things like that where people will just completely just twist the actual fossil evidence and claim that a part wasn't discovered when it actually was. But then there's also, yeah, I mean, see, a lot of people like to go back to these earlier papers that were written when evolutionists were still in conflict about that and then draw from those, even though that whole community has kind of moved on from that. Okay. Shall We've we got... uh, put the slide yeah. back up? Okay. Oh, sure. Awesome. Thank you. Um, let's see here. Yeah, so going on to the pelvis here, this is another part of the body, which looks quite different depending on whether you're looking at a chimpanzee or a human. It's obviously kind of unique depending on how you walk because that's where all your weight basically goes through. And in a chimpanzee, what you can see here is it's more like a flat blade. And so their intestines and guts and everything hang down from those blades. Whereas in a human, your guts hang down through your chest and rest on those. So there's a bit of a difference in how exactly weight bearing goes onto your pelvis. And um, the same thing is true for the femur. If you, if you put the femur like this, you can see how a chimpanzee femur is straight up and down and a human femur is on a slant. And that's something that actually helps us walk upright. I've, I've got some bones right here, uh, a cast of chimpanzee and a human, and you can see that, that a human femur has a tilt to it. And that's because we try to put our weight underneath us, unlike a chimpanzee. And that's why when chimpanzees try to walk upright, they can't really do so very effectively because their femur uh, is just straight up and down. So when we look at creatures like the Australopithecines, here's Lucy's pelvis. Look at that. I mean, Look how similar Lucy's pelvis is to the human. You can obviously see there, there's quite a bit of similarity between the human and Lucy as compared to the chimpanzee. And in the same thing, when we look at the femur, Lucy's femur isn't necessarily the best specimen of this species, but from the neck and other features, we, and somewhat from the bottom, we can tell that it was on an angle like a human rather than a chimpanzee. So the question then becomes, okay, so these Australopithecines were walking upright. What are the implications? What does that mean for creationists? So there's several important passages in the Bible that talk about the creation of uh, man. Here's some here. Uh, Genesis 2 verse 7, then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living creature. So it's obviously quite a bit different, I would argue, from an evolutionary view of human origins. Uh, rather than evolving from the Australopithecines, we were made out of the dust of the ground. So that gives us kind of a definition of what it means to be human, right? We have the image of God, we have a soul and a body, we have rational thought. And interestingly, I think this is a particularly important one. Humans are descendants of Adam and Eve. So then that kind of brings up the question, how do we tell what is a human and what is not a human? You can take the slides down for now. Okay. Yeah, so that's uh, a very important question, right? So when we look at the fossil record, how do we decide between all these different 
types and forms of creatures. I'll, I'll show you some right here. So first of all, I've got here the chimpanzee skeleton or skull here. And you'll notice some things about it, like these big teeth up here. And that's something that's unique to uh, animals. Um, and when we get to the Australopithecines, we notice uh, some similarities that they have, like this brow ridge, and they had somewhat more pronounced canine teeth. Um, but they have some of those features that we saw in the chimpanzee, but in addition, they also have uh, features which show they walked upright. So when we turn the skull over, it has this frame and magnum, this big hole right in the middle on the bottom showing that it walked upright. So the question becomes, okay, so this creature has lots of affinities to living non-human apes, but it appears to be walking upright. And then we have this creature here. This is called Australopithecus sediba, and it was found in 2008, and it has a, a very interesting mix of features. So we have these creatures which appear to be kind of in the middle, kind of, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, how do we tell the difference? So based on that idea from the Bible that all humans are descendants of Adam and Eve, we can kind of work backward, right? So we know that we are descendants of Adam and Eve, and thus Adam and Eve must have at least somewhat looked like us. There's been a kind of trend in creationism to think that Adam and Eve were exactly like us. Um, but I, I don't necessarily think that's correct. And we'll get into that a little bit later. But that's kind of another issue of debate. What were Adam and Eve like? That's a, that's a good question from a creationist perspective. So, um, yeah, maybe we want to go back to the slide here, if that works. Mm-hmm. I don't have, you don't, you're not sharing the slide right now. You need to share it again. Let's see here. There we go. You should be able to see it now. No. Hmm. Can't see it. Let's see here. Don't worry. I'll talk to the audience <laughs> while you're, while you're fiddling with that. There we go. Okay. I think you should see it now. Let's see here. We'll go down to here. Can you see that now? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So from the Bible, we have this idea of the Brahmin, and that is kind of this group of creatures that is discontinuous of other groups of creatures. So it says in Genesis, when God talks about creating these different groups of creatures, that they're created according to their kind, but then also... Um, it does say that they're going to reproduce according to their kind. For example, when it talks about plants, it talks about them bringing forth seed according to their kind. So from the Bible, we get this idea that we have these groups of animals that are bringing forth creatures that are like themselves. I have here the example of a rabbit where we have this ancestral rabbit down here and it diversifies into all these different types of rabbits and yet they still remain rabbits. Uh, there's some type of intrinsic rabbitness, if you would like to call it that, um, that somehow is continuous throughout this whole group. And thus, we would expect rabbits to be their own distinct type, uh, possibly. They might actually be with some other group. Uh, but the idea being, yeah, there's this kind of group in nature, and all rabbits today are descendants of a single ancestral rabbit. So when we go to the Bible, we would expect the same thing, right? That all humans are descendants from Adam and Eve, because it says in scripture, Eve is the mother of all living. So the question goes, how do we get from Adam and Eve then to what we have today, right? Where we have all sorts of different types of humans all over the world. But then we also have all these unique extinct forms of humans. You can take down the slide. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, so that's a big question then, right? Okay, so we've got all these different fossils. How exactly do we understand them from a creationist perspective? So the basis of that is we have to be able to tell what is human and what is not, right? Um, but the question is, is there such 
a, a distinct line between humans and non-humans, right? Evolutionists would, of course, claim that there isn't much of a distinct line. People I've heard say, you know, you cannot tell us what is human and what is not. And from a biblical standpoint, I think we would say, yeah, we actually can tell the difference between humans and non-humans. And I don't, I don't think we can just look at a skull and say, oh, based on this one feature, all humans have this, and nothing else has this. I think it's a whole suite of characters. So we have combinations of characters that other creatures don't. For example, um, we might have something that these other group of creatures has, but we also have another feature that they don't. So it's not so clear cut. And that's kind of where the whole idea of barominology comes into determining exactly what is a human and, and what is not. So, yeah, you can, uh, if you'd like to share again now. Yeah, so this here is a graph. It's taken from the paper that I published last fall. And basically what this is, is we're looking at all these different ways of uh, statistically evaluating organisms. So we have here on the left, these different uh, species. Um, we have here, for example, Homo sapiens, that's us, and Pantroglodites, and that's a common chimpanzee. So these vertical rows are basically all these different ways that we look at things. And when we evaluate them, what we found is very interesting. They fall into these groups. All these humans fell into group one. Uh, chimpanzees and these Australopithecines fell into group two. And then these other creatures fell into group three. So... What's interesting is that across all of these analyses that we did, they all fell into the exact same groups, which is very interesting. Wow. Yeah, that is fascinating because you might think there would be some features common here and here, but yeah. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And, we, and when we look at the graph, here's a graph. So each of those individual uh, dot, each of these individual rows here is a representation of a graph like this. And Basically, what this shows is kind of the two-dimensional view of exactly how they cluster. You can see here, okay, this Paranthropus, this is another type of upright walking ape. Uh, you can see those three species just cluster way up in the corner by themselves. That's very interesting because you can see that they are not very similar to either humans or to these Australopithecines here. And yeah, what I we see. find... Interesting here is that there's discontinuity between the Australopithecines and uh, the humans. So um, what we see here, okay, so this is Australopithecus sedibe right here. It's this creature that I brought up before um, right here. And there's been a whole debate about exactly whether this creature is human or not. And there's been other creationists who've said it isn't. And there's been evolutionists who have argued that it might fall into the human category. And what's interesting is that we find that it falls right in here, right into the human category. It's this one with a black square about it here. Uh -huh. You can see it falls right in between these three hu other human species here. Oh, now, wow. A bit of debate about this, actually, because it is a juvenile skull. And as, um, as apes mature, they tend to become... Um, more divergent so when it when a chimpanzee is born it looks a lot like a human baby actually because it has like a kind of flatter face and it doesn't have such big teeth and kind of the frame and magnum that hole on the bottom of the skull isn't like in the position of adult chimpanzee and since this is a juvenile um it's possible that it could just be clustering there because it's a juvenile and it hasn't developed those features yet but it seems that it was like an adolescent uh so it's it from what we know right now, it seems somewhat credible, at least, to place it into the human category. And that's really interesting because this species was called Australopithecus sediba. And so you would think then that it would be with the other Australopithecines. But no, in fact, rather than even clustering kind of in an intermediate position here, as evolutionists would claim that it would somehow be in this kind of intermediate population between the Australopithecines and humans. In fact, it clusters far within the human group. Mm. So uh, we tested those claims um, 
in several ways. So this is an interesting graph here. So what we did was we basically manually forced the computer program to place that creature, Australopithecus sediba, into those other groups. So you can see here, we put it into oh, wow. this green group here. So you can see how this bar extends backwards rather than forwards like the rest. Mm. That's... It's based off of something called silhouette width. This is kind of a graph here. Basically, silhouette width tells us how good something clusters. And you can see here, it has a huge negative, uh, mm. more than negative 0.4, you can see here. And so that tells us that Australopithecus sediba does not align good with these other Australopithecines. We did wow. the same thing for putting it in the Paranthropus, and it works even worse. So that's very interesting here that we not only are able to tell what is a human, what is not a human, we're also able to look at these creatures that seem maybe to fall in between and we can recognize exactly which group they are part of. Well, this is interesting. You know, I, we see, you know, if you, if you look on a lot of websites and stuff, you'll see skulls lined up in a progression. And so like, what do you think about that skull progression lineup and how does that correspond with this data that you're showing? Mm -hmm. I, I think that those sorts of lineups are kind of simplistic, right? They're basically based off of small brains to large brains. And yeah, I mean, if you put them in order of their major metric date, you might say, okay, well, maybe, you know, if these things are all related, I could see how they are kind of this progression. But I think that when we actually look at them like this, we see that there is huge gaps between them. And that kind of raises the question, why aren't evolutionists looking at the fossils with statistical analyses like these? Instead, they like to use something called a phylogeny, right? It's kind of this branching tree that shows, you know, how things are related based on their similarities. And the problem with phylogenies that evolutionists always use is that they assume common ancestry. Right. Well, from a creationist perspective, we can't assume common ancestry of all these groups. Right. So we have to look at other interesting ways of, of looking at them. And this is certainly a, an interesting way of looking at them based on all these similarities and kind of recognizing them without like forcing them all onto an evolutionary tree. OK, wow. Um, um, you're getting Guzman says this is incredible. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Are you and he, Guzman friends? Do you know him? I'm actually going to meet with him this this week. We had a, a meeting scheduled for last week, and I messed up. And uh, yeah, but we're going to talk this week and uh, oh, good. meet each other for the first time. So good. Yes. Here's another uh, uh, graph from our paper. This one is a little more complex. Um, you can see here we have a little bit of a different grouping here. Up here we have some. Uh, extent apes, we have chimpanzees and gorillas, and then we have some Australopithecines here, and then Africanus is an outlier, and then Homo floresiensis on every single thing ends up being different, which is very strange. We think it might have something to do with not having enough characters for that, but you can see here across the huge body of humans, they all end up being in the same cluster, and that includes Australopithecus sediba here. As you can see, in every single analysis we run, mm. once again, it shows up as being human. Wow. We go on to another part of that analysis here, and we see some kind of interesting things. Um, generally, though, it kind of tends to be the same. This is kind of interesting because we have these three Australopithecus species grouping together, mm -hmm. um, but generally it remains the same. Now, this shows one interesting pattern, which I think we sometimes see. And this is this little block of, of squares right here. You can see that in these, in these four analyses here, we got this group of organisms that are humans, but they fall into this specific type here. We have Georgian Homo erectus, Homo rudolfensis, Homo habilis, and Australopithecus sediba, which I find is really interesting because we have three of those species are all from... Um, the continent of Africa, I think mainly South Africa. And then Georgian Homo erectus is from Georgia. So kind of in the Near East, kind of by the Black Sea. And we have this kind of interesting block here where all these things kind of seem to align together to kind of be a subset within the humans. 
So mm -hmm. uh, maybe we'll touch on that more later. Um, but what you can see here again is now we we tried this once again with Australopithecus sediba. Mm -hmm. We tried putting it with this other cluster here. And you can see it has this huge negative silhouette width again. We tried the same thing with Homo naledi, which some creationists have debated. And uh, it's status as human. And you can see once again, we have a huge no negative silhouette width indicating it probably isn't part of that group. And interestingly, we have the wow. same thing here with this Australopithecus. Uh, this kind of always seems to be an outlier from the other ones. Mm -hmm. So that is a little bit of about how exactly creationists, you can turn off the slide, are kind of looking at exactly which things are human and which things are not human. Okay. Now, you, you have some, some of these specimens. You have casts and stuff of them, right? Um, yes. So... Uh, can you show us the uh, Australopithecus sediba? Yeah, absolutely. So this is the cast of Australopithecus sediba here. This is the juvenile skull. It's it's nicknamed Carabo. And uh, you can see it here. Mm. Yeah. See, I look at that. It does look a little more um, ape-like. So... Talk to talk to me about what like um I, like so this that, putting away the data. Talk to me about the features that make this human. Yeah, so there's a, a number of different kind of things about it that align it with humans. Um, some of that is, for example, the dental characteristics. It's not on this particular specimen, as you can see. That's all reconstruction, all that white stuff there. Mm -hmm. uh, so we don't actually have it for this one, but there's another creature of the species that's an adult female that we have that from. And there's some features, for example, the very kind of flat molars that's something humans have. Um, based on the skull, there's various aspects of the brain uh, that make it align with humans. Um, there are a number of features of the skull that are kind of extremely technical that indicate what, how exactly it is related or seems to be very similar to humans. But that's kind of very interesting, right? That we have this group that is kind of different from a lot of humans, right? And that was that group I brought up. We have Australopithecus sediba, something called Homo habilis, Homo mm -hmm. rudolfensis, and Homo georgicus. And all of those are actually very old species, which I find very interesting that the further back we go, we kind of have perhaps this kind of suite of characters. Um, so the very oldest um, of those, according to radiometric dating, would be, I believe it is, uh, Homo habilis by a little bit. So yeah, we have Homo habilis, what appears to be the very oldest human. Then we have Australopithecus sediba, Homo rudolfensis, and then Georgicus, which appears to be like a very, very early Homo erectus. Mm -hmm. And they all have this kind of interesting morphology. And um, yeah, so then that kind of brings the question, okay, so what were the very first humans like? And that is a very controversial question among creationists. And I would argue that the first humans did not look exactly like you and me. They were not Homo sapiens. And that's mm. going to make a lot of people upset, probably, um, because we've always been kind of conditioned to think like that, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, when you see depictions of Adam and Eve in kind of classical literature, you'll notice that people often drew them as, you know, light-skinned, fair-skinned Europeans with blue eyes and blonde hair. Uh, you know, so we tend to kind of think that they must have looked like our culture, Right. But mm -hmm. I don't think that was actually the case. Mm. Now, but just to be clear, you don't think they descended from apes. So you're not saying that, hey, we, you know, at we were evolving Absolutely. and somehow at some point people were, you know, right. What I'm saying human. is that. Mm -hmm. Uh, humans have diversified over time. So before I, I showed that picture of rabbits, right? Rabbits mm -hmm. have diversified over time. Um, every kind from a creationist perspective, we started with some members of the kind and at Noah's Ark, we probably got down to like two individuals, right? Who were aboard the Ark. And then after the Ark, they diversified. So for example, take iguanas. Um, 
we have tons of different types of iguanas today. We have marine iguanas, green iguanas, tons of different types. And those all came from some ancestral iguanas, right? And so I think the same thing is happening within the humankind as well, right? So for a long time, we thought, oh, well, we humans have just always looked like ourselves, right? But I don't think that's the case because just like humans have, or sorry, iguanas have diversified and rabbits have diversified, I think in the same way, humans have diversified. Mm -hmm. So then the question becomes, okay, so how do we get from whatever Adam and Eve looked like to what we look like today? So first we need to know what Adam and Eve looked like, right? So maybe I'll present kind of my reasoning for why Homo sapiens was not the first human. Um, okay. The, the further back we go, looking at the fossils of our species, we find that they actually tend to look kind of more archaic. They get like bigger brow ridges, their brain shape gets different. Um, lots of different aspects of their bodies change. And so the further back we go in the fossil record of our own species, it begins to look more and more like something that we call Homo heidelbergensis. And so it appears that our own species actually was, uh, the predecessor of our species was this species called Homo heidelbergensis. And um, yeah, so Homo sapiens is absent from most of this kind of time span that we're looking at, especially for like when we're looking at the specifically the human genus. Homo sapiens seems to be kind of more recent type of species. So what exactly were Adam and Eve like then? That's that's kind of the big question. How do we really figure that out? The, the big answer is we really can't. Um, we can't really know exactly what they were like, unfortunately. It's, it's very unlikely that we'll be able to find deposits that were deposited before the flood. And uh, we I don't think we've ever found human fossils in the flood either. So we're left kind of with looking at the very earliest human fossils we can find. And what were those like? Well, we have Homo habilis. That was a very small creature. It was only three foot five tall about. Um, we have Homo rudolfensis, who was about that same size, Australopithecus sediba, about that size. And then we have something called Homo erectus, uh, specifically Georgian erectus from Georgia. And that is very similar in size to modern humans. So we have kind of a model. If we're going with the very oldest, we'd have to say that perhaps Homo habilis is kind of the predecessor. But I am... I think that it's probably actually Homo erectus. I'm going to be doing some work on this soon, actually, and hopefully kind of doing a little research and trying to parse out if we can kind of figure out a little bit about exactly which human state is the ancestral one. But right now I lean towards Homo erectus being that I don't have a skull right here to show you, but... And so uh, I have a couple of questions related yeah. to this, but, but one is you're talking about going further back are you corresponding the geologic layers? And so like, are you saying the farther down it is older, mm -hmm. you're, you don't think those are flood layers? Yeah, so that, that comes to the question, right? What is the boundary between flood and post-flood? As you probably know, a lot of creation geologists would place that at the crustaceous tertiary boundary. Mm -hmm. um, there's kind of this, that's kind of where evolutionists believe the dinosaurs all went extinct. And there was like that giant asteroid that hit the earth. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where creationists believe that the flood ends and going up from then, then it's a post flood world. Mm. And so all the human fossils that we've ever found happen after that point in mm. the fossil record, which is interesting. It's certainly a challenge and a, a problem that young earth creationists have to spend some time and thought thinking about. Okay. And so you are, you're, you are using um, radiometric dating, not as exact, not, not that it is precise, but mm -hmm. you're using it for relative dating. Correct. I, I think in terms of relative dating, I think it can be at least somewhat helpful. I, I think using kind of stratigraphy is obviously more, I think more kind of empirical. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's not helpful in a number of situations because we find like bones of these things deep within caves and we can't really relate that to layers on the outside. So, you know, when you're dealing with all these things that are buried in different types of locations, it's hard to exactly correlate them 
Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's certainly a challenge. Now, the one question that's coming to my mind is where do Neanderthals fit in all this? Yeah. So that's a great question. Here's a Neanderthal right here. It's a rather late Neanderthal, so it doesn't have all the features of uh, the classic Neanderthal, but he does have a lot. You can see the giant brow ridge, the big, huge nose here, uh, the very long skull here. Um, yeah, so I have a slide here about that, so maybe I'll pull that up here. Okay. Um, yeah. Are you able to see that? Not yet. How about now? Maybe I have no. to restart this. Okay. Seems like every time I go to a slide, I'm going to have to bring it up again. Yeah. I think that's because you, you removed it. Maybe. Yeah. Oops. Yeah. Sorry. There we go. Can you see that now? Yeah. Okay. There we go. Great. Yeah, so there's been a bunch of different views from creationists on the Neanderthals. And basically, the Neanderthals are uh, a little bit older than us, it seems, but we lived contemporaneously for somewhat of a period of time. So there's been a lot of different ideas about the Neanderthals. Uh, one of those started soon after they were found, a man named Rudolf Virchow. He's kind of considered somewhat the father of um, some fields of medicine. And he thought that Neanderthals were people who had bone diseases like rickets. And rickets is this bone that disease I'm sure you've heard of where from a lack of sunlight, your body doesn't make vitamin D, uh, your bones become more brittle and your bones can break, but they often will just bend. So you can see kind of my little cartoony diagram of the femur here, how it's bent. Um, mm -hmm. That's what happens with people with rickets. If you look at them, their bones and their legs will literally like bow under the stress. And Rudolf Virchow knew that the bones of Neanderthals' legs had a curve to them. So mm -hmm. he then kind of, you know, asserted, you know, they, these must have been people with rickets. Um, the problem is that the bone of the Neanderthal is actually bowed in a completely different way than somebody who has rickets. So thinking of a femur here, I've got one right here. Mm -hmm. um, people with rickets have a bow out to the side like this because mm -hmm. they're, if this is your body here, their, their weight forces the femur to curve like this. Mm. But Neanderthals actually had a different type of curve. Their curve happened like this on the back side of the femur. Mm. So it's a completely different type of curvature that can't be caused by a bone disease like that. Um, so that, that brings us up with a question, exactly why did they have a, a femur that was curved like that? It might have been, had something to do with uh, musculature, but I'm not exactly sure. Um, then there was somebody named Jack Cuozo. I have his book right here. It's called Buried Alive. It's, mm -hmm. uh, he suggests that Neanderthals are really people who are very old. And so... He talks about, right, after the flood, right, we have people who are still living for hundreds of years. And so he claims that Neanderthals are really old people, and that's why they have all these features. And he, his son-in-law made kind of this whole computer program looking at exactly how creatures age over time and kind of showed that your brow would get a little bit bigger and your chin would grow a little less if you live for, like, 500 years or something like that, supposedly. Mm. But uh, I would argue against that as well because interestingly we find fossils of juvenile neanderthals mm. so like babies uh even fetuses um so that's interesting right that we have neanderthals that are unique even when they're young mm -hmm. and so that clearly tells us then that they can't be the result of old age mm -hmm. um and then we have congenital syphilis and there's a whole host of other diseases i wrote a paper about this I haven't published, but maybe I should sometime uh, because like tons and tons of different diseases have been like suggested by people to explain like every aspect of Neanderthal morphology. And mm -hmm. they're all <laughs> kind of at the base, somewhat kind of crazy, uh, congenital syphil syphilis, um, pronounced brow. Yeah. The, the One of the problems is this disease ends up with like weird spacing of your teeth. 
uh, and kind of abnormal mm. dentition, which isn't something that we see in Neanderthals, which is why this is discredited as well. So we end up then with all these different ideas about Neanderthals being kind of discarded. Um, so Neanderthals were their own distinct species. And we know that because from their fossils, we can tell this, that they didn't have these diseases. Um, and also we have their DNA, right? So that's one thing that makes Neanderthals a very interesting group because we can actually look at their DNA and compare it to that of modern humans. And we can see that modern humans outside of Africa can have like up to 4% of Neanderthal DNA. And so um, that tells us that Neanderthals were this own unique species that sometimes interbred with our own population. Now, um, Elizabeth asks how many Neanderthals have been found. I guess it all, she always thought it wasn't that many. Hmm. That's a great question. Um, I don't have the number offhand, but there's undoubtedly hundreds of them. Uh, basically, their range is all throughout Europe into the Middle East. There's been discoveries in Israel. Um, yeah, all over there have been Neanderthals found. We have complete skeletons, basically, of these creatures. So, yeah, Neanderthals are probably the most well understood hominins beside ourselves because we found burials, just complete, amazingly preserved skeletons of these creatures. Now, you called them creatures, but these are just humans, right? Yes. I, I, I sometimes use the word creature because I, I use that in a sense in which we are part of creation, um, mm -hmm. but we aren't animals. Yeah, so that's kind of what I meant by that. Yeah, and so um, now how does that work with how did we get Neanderthal DNA mm -hmm. when... Um, I mean, these are supposedly hundreds of thousands of years old, right? These. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a very valid point, right? We have that with this dinosaur soft tissue and stuff that's come out too. And I don't think we have, evolutionists have a good explanation for how exactly DNA has survived that long, especially in the case of, yeah, dinosaurs, obviously, but even from a creationist perspective, I kind of find it sometimes hard to believe that we have this DNA, right? That's that's pretty spectacular to me that it could survive for several thousand years. So, yeah, I mean, they've come up with rescuing devices for how exactly you can get this in dinosaur bones, something about hemoglobin in the blood supposedly preserving it, but I don't think they have a very good answer to that. And I think that is definitely a very... Um, interesting point in favor of creationism saying, yeah, these things really aren't hundreds of thousands of years old, but really more recent than that. Well, how did we get the DNA? Because, you know, I, from what I understand, when you find fossils, they don't have any actual bone left in them. Is yes. that, I was recently told this. So is that true? And if so, how did we get the DNA? Well, that depends. Okay, so there's. it depends what you define fossilization as. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes fossilization is talked about in terms of permineralization. That's when the minerals actually like seep in and like remove all the biological material. Mm -hmm. There's also just forms of preservation, which sometimes people call fossilization. And sometimes we don't find, we find things that aren't even fossilized at all. For example, Homo floresiensis, this little dwarf human from the island of Flores in Indonesia, those bones weren't even fossilized at all. And so they were just extremely fragile. The, the people excavating called them like wet blotting paper, how fragile they were. And uh, yeah, so sometimes we find things that aren't even fossilized at all. Um, and those are and so fragile. did we take sometimes the we DNA of Homo florensis? Then did we take the DNA of Homo florensis? Unfortunately, because of the conditions in that cave being all wet and everything, the DNA had actually degraded, it seems. And so we weren't ever able to recover DNA from that. What about carbon dating it? Um, hmm. I, I'm not sure if carbon dating has been performed on that particular specimen. Mm -hmm. it, it's radiometric dating would place it like around, let me think. Uh, a little less than 20,000 years old, I think. So according, if you believe in carbon dating, it should be like within the range, but I don't know if that's actually been performed on Homo floresiensis. Hmm. So um, 
Yeah, here I, I'll have a, a slide to bring up here that you'll find interesting. This is kind of a compilation of different creationist views on the Australopithecines. Can you see that now? Yes. Wonderful. Yeah, so this is another very controversial topic among creationists, and it's what exactly were the Australopithecines like? Were they bipedal, quadrupedal, or um, this mixed hypodime? Um, so basically, some people think that these aren't actually real taxa at all, that really some human bones and some bones of some other creatures got mixed all together, and scientists thought they all belonged to one creature. Um, so you can see here, we have a lot of different views on this. One of the base proponents of this view that Lucy was just this quadrupedal creature is uh, David Menton, who recently passed away, but was a researcher for the Creation Museum. And uh, he has videos where he talks about the uh, pelvis and everything. And um, But you can see there's a number of different people here at different, these are people from ICR, uh, Michael Ord, um, some prominent people who would hold to that view. And then for this view, there's the book Contested Bones. Dr. John Sanford and Christopher Rupi wrote together this book called Contested Bones, in which they argue that Australopithecus afarensis is kind of this mixed up species. And then there's people who say that uh, Lucy was partially bipedal. And I've got some various authors listed here. And what I found interesting is that in modern creationism, basically, 99% of people believe that the Australopithecines weren't bipedal. But when I went back to some of these older creationist books, I found a bit of a different view. I'll, uh, I'll read some quotes here um, from Martin Lubnow of Bones of Contention, which I think you mentioned that you've read. Um, he says, the evidence for Australopithecine bipedality is controversial. While there is strong evidence that Australopithecine locomotion was significantly different from that of modern humans or other primates, the issue is irrelevant. Bipedality does not prove a human relationship. So that's certainly an interesting view, right? Uh, he was, uh, yeah, the book was published quite a while back, and he was a kind of very early creationist to be writing on the topic. And he took a bit of a different topic than most uh, creationists today. And then... Um, Let's see, from Jack Cuozo, who wrote that book, Buried Alive, about the Neanderthals. He said that apes probably were more complex at an early time in Earth history, had more abilities, and might have been able to walk close to upright. So mm. that, that's very interesting that they have a lot of different views among this in the creationist community. And I think probably the view that eventually will become dominant is the view that they were bipedal. I, I say here partially bipedal because my own particular view is that uh, – the Australopithecines did a bit of both. They were uh, walking on the ground, but they were also able to climb in the trees. And I think, um, yeah, I think that is probably the correct view. And this is kind of an interesting breakdown of exactly how creationists have thought about that over time. So maybe we can talk a little bit now about exactly how we get from Adam and Eve, whatever they're ancestral condition is to us and all these other different groups of organisms or all these other humans. Um, because we have like upwards of 20 different human species that have been named. Mm. Which people find very interesting, right? 20, like that, that's quite a lot of different humans that lived in the past, right? So how do we get from Adam and Eve to that in this time period, right? So we have um, the flood and then after the flood, we have the Tower of Babel. And that's when a lot of creationists would suggest that this diversification began. So following the Tower of Babel, people go out into the wilderness, right, in these kind of smaller groups. Before, they'd been all living in the society together, and now they're kind of in each of their own uh, individual, perhaps, family groups. And that's where some interesting things related to diversification can kind of come in. Because we have a, um, something called uh, fixing mutations. And perhaps you've heard evolutionists talk about this before. So a creature has a mutation. If it's in one of its reproductive cells, when it reproduces, it passes that mutation on to its descendant. So about every generation within humans, we get 80 new mutations. 
So you are more mutated than your parents. Um, but usually most of these mutations never really become like very widespread because one, one for one thing, it takes very long time because human generations have such a long generation time that, you know, some unique mutation you got from your parents, it's going to take a very, very long time for, for that to spread through the whole population of homo sapiens, right? Because, you know, your children have to marry and then so on to get this mm -hmm. spread to humans everywhere. But when you have people all together in a small family group, something quite different happens, right? Then suddenly when people are intermarrying, you have pop, uh, mutations being fixed in the population much, much faster, right? So any new unique mutation that you have suddenly gets, or, or the whole population will end up having that, right? So that's how within a very short time, we can have these creatures that end up looking quite a bit different from others. And then we also have another factor to diversification, and that would be climate, climate adaptation. So that's something we see in Neanderthals. Um, when we look at their bones, uh, we can tell that they were short kind of consistently on the shorter end. Um, yeah, five foot eight, perhaps, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and that's interesting, especially even for males, they were that short. And one reason why we think they may have been that is a certain set of biological rules called Bergman and Allen's rules. And basically what those rules say, uh, kind of generally uh, predict, is that creatures in cold climates will kind of be more stocky and have shorter appendages, whereas creatures in warm climates will be uh, kind of taller, longer, longer extremities. And that's very interesting because we see the Neanderthals being kind of very short, stocky people who are very muscular. And um, yeah, perhaps that's an instance in which Neanderthals adapted to the cold climate in which they live. So those are some different kind of methods of how exactly we got from this ancestral population of humans to yeah. all these different species and types. Now, can you show us, I know you've got some other fossils there. Do you, can you show us some examples of things that are passed as human ancestors that you do not think are human ancestors? Yeah. Um, right here, I've got, a skull. I showed it already, but I'll show it again. Um, this is Mrs. Plez. It is the fossil of an Australopithecus. And it was found by a man named Robert Broom, who blew it out of a rock using dynamite, <laughs> uh, which is something paleoanthropologists today would never do. And by blowing it up, he ended up getting this nice little crack running through the whole fossil. Um, but it's a very complete specimen of the skull. And this is belonging to the species called Australopithecus africanus. And so this would typically be considered to be ancestral to humans. And I am would propose that it is, in fact, not a human ancestor, but in fact belongs to its own probably created kind of Australopithecines. Okay. And what are the features? Um, and I'm sorry, are there any other ones you want to show us? Yeah, I can, uh, I can get some of here a moment. <laughs> Let's see. And I'll just put up some of the comments while you're getting those. Evidence and reason says fixing in evolutionary biology doesn't mean repair, as in getting my car fixed. Can't they use a better word? <laughs> um, he also says, Gr great slide by Paleologos. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thanks for being here, everyone. Mm -hmm. Yes. This is another skull of an Australopithecus. It's called STW-53, I believe. It's another Australopithecus uh, Africanus individual, I believe. Mm -hmm. You can see it's a bit more fragmentary than the Mrs. Plez fossil that I just showed you. There's some, mm -hmm. basically a full dentition, some bits of the brow there, a bit of the back of the skull here. But um, yeah, so, so what are some features which set it apart? One is the canine teeth. You can see here how they have a, a tooth there that's somewhat more pronounced. It's not as pronounced as in chimpanzees, but it is uh, different from that in humans. Um, the molars are something that's different as well. You see these giant molars teeth, and that tells us that they had like a 
herbivorous diet. They were eating some grasses and, and other things. Um, especially in another genus called the Paranthropus, which we talked about earlier. It was kind of that genus that always clumped way, way far away to the side. Um, they especially had like giant molars, like the diameter of a quarter in size. And they were huge vegetation eaters. And that's somewhat why they had that. Um, some features, they have a bit of a different uh, nose shape in this individual. Mm -hmm. You can't see it really because it's, it's not there. Um, the bit of the brow is shaped differently. Kind of the whole general just shape of the cranium takes a, a different way. Um, something among these australopithecines, which is sometimes unique, they have a little crest running along the top of their head uh, where their chew chewing muscles connect to. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of different features that we can tell these different creatures apart. I mean, in this study I'm working on right now, we have 300 or more craniodental characters. So features of the skull and the teeth. Wow. So okay. one interesting thing to talk about might be talking about reconstructions because a lot of people th freak out when I show them a skull like this and they realize yeah. that the only part of the skull that is actually real is the part that's colored, right? The white part is mm -hmm. made up, right? Well, not really. For example, when you go to a museum and see a dinosaur skeleton, I mean, very, very few complete dinosaur skeletons have ever been found. Mm -hmm. um, but somehow they know, right, how to how to make a dinosaur skeleton because they have other individuals of that same species, right? So if you found, uh, if I found your, a skull of a human laying in a field, I could reconstruct the entire body of it, right? Even without finding mm -hmm. any of the rest of the body because I know what human skeletons look like, right? We have all sorts of other human skeletons to look at. And it, so it's the same thing with these creatures. Yeah, we might only find a couple little pieces of the skull, but we can uh, we can put them all together onto a complete skull like that because we have found other more complete ones. So yes, some of our fossils are fragmentary, but it's not just guesswork and imagination to make them fit together like that. We're actually making or basing the work off of other more complete fossils. Mm, okay. But on the the ones that are lined up for human ancestors, um, would you say there's complete skeletons of all of those? Um, not for all of them. Um, let's let's begin at the beginning. Um, let's say uh, the very kind of most oldest, according to radiometric dates, hominin that most people would accept is Aurora tugenensis. Um, We've never found a skull of it, uh, not even any fragments. We only have some femoral pieces and a few other postcranial bones. So that's very fragmentary. Um, Sahelanthropus to Chadnensis uh, is a little later, or yeah, a little later in the record. Um, from that, we basically have a single skull. And really interestingly, it was found in this pile of bones on the surface and some of the bones it was like with like weren't even belonging to its species. And supposedly there's a femoral shaft that belonged to it. I don't think it's very clear whether that shaft of the femur actually belongs to the skull or not, but um, yeah, so we don't have very much for that either. Then we get to a genus called Artipithecus. We have basically one good skeleton of Artipithecus. It's called Arti, and it's from the middle of Wash River Basin of Ethiopia. And that skull um, is, is very interesting. We have a bit of the body, um, but generally kind of the closer we get to the present, the more complete skeletons we find just because there hasn't been as much time to kind of damage and destroy them. Right. And, and so, yeah, of the Australopithecines, we have beautiful skeletons, like for example, Littlefoot, maybe you've heard of it. It was found in this mm -hmm. cave in, at Sturkfontein in South Africa. We have basically the entire skeleton. So a lot of times people like will critique Lucy, for example. Um, Lucy is this famous hominin skeleton from Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. And they'll say like how evolutionists are just making this stuff up. Well, that's not actually true though, because we have other bones of her, her same species. And uh, yeah, so once again, that's what we're basing those reconstructions off when those are made. So yeah, so for the Australopithecines, we have basically complete skeletons that are 
available. And for most of the humans we do too, except for Homo habilis. Um, Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis both remain kind of somewhat elusive. And we found some very fragmentary skeletons that can kind of give us the general limb proportions, but we haven't ever really found a very good skeleton of Homo habilis or Homo rudolfensis yet. Mm -hmm. But for a lot of these things, and especially like Neanderthals, Homo erectus, we have some pretty nice skeletons. Cool. Um, do you want to take questions? Yeah, I'd be happy to do some questions now. Okay. If anybody has a question, please put it in the chat and I'll put up one that's already been asked. Elizabeth Gross says, if there were small groups that emerged after the Tower of Babel, wouldn't those differences have stayed typical of that group until present day if those groups remain isolated? Well, um, those those different those features that they had. Okay, so when we were thinking about this, okay, we have each of these different groups that goes out from Babel. Um, the reason why they don't stay the same until the present day is because they each have mutations occurring, right? So each group has different mutations happening within that group. And also they're going out into different climates, right? And so they're getting different climactic adaptations. So you start with one ancestral population and you can over time get into lots of different types because different mutations happen and they're adapting to different sorts of environments. And um, on that line, you know, it'd be good to mention that every human today is a homo sapiens. So uh, somehow evolutionists are wondering about this yet too. Somehow we have all these other hominin species die out and today we're only left with homo sapiens, which is very interesting. Um, and I think that's definitely an area where we need more research to understand exactly why all these other different types of humans died out and left only us. It appears that perhaps we interbred with a lot of them, uh, for example, Neanderthals and Denisovans, and also some other ghost populations that we've detected using DNA. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that we've detected them using DNA? So basically, um, in DNA analyses, they can kind of look at these, um, they can look at these unique kind of genetic sequences that certain populations will have. And they can tell then that there was some ancestral um, human that gave those features to that population, but we don't know exactly what that, uh, what that human was. So in the example of Denisovans, they, we don't really know a lot about their anatomy. We've only ever found like a few teeth and some postcranial bones, but we were able to get DNA from them. So it's a very interesting situation where we have the DNA and we have basically none of the bones. Um, mm -hmm. But from that, we've been able to tell that a lot of people like in New Guinea and uh, Eastern Asia have a lot of uh, Denisovan DNA in them, whereas other people around the world do not. Yeah, I was listening to one of your videos and you said uh, on some of the genetic testing they do, they can tell you how much Neanderthal you have. Yeah, there's a site yeah. called, I think it's called 23andMe, if you get a genetic test. Most humans have like between, I think it's 2 and 4% Neanderthal mm -hmm. DNA. Yeah, so it's, that's definitely very interesting that we ship. And that, that shows uh, how human they were, right? A lot of time we get the perception that these other human species were very kind of distant and archaic. But that's not what we get from the fossil record. And I think this is somewhat due to evolutionary ideas. I think... Uh, portrayals of humans tend to make them look very um, non-human and uh, kind of wild and stuff. But no, from Neanderthals, we have burials, um, concentrations of pollen right over the skeleton, which appears <laughs> possibly to have come from flowers laid during burial. Um, we have this reddish mineral that they would dust over uh, dead bodies. It's called red ochre, and we find it on a lot of different Neanderthal skeletons and skulls, showing that these people were doing symbolic burial of their dead. We have jewelry, cave paintings, all this stuff from Neanderthals. And then we also have art dating back to Homo erectus as well. So yeah, I, I think sometimes we can kind of get the idea that these other creatures, these other humans were archaic, but they were not. They were human-like in behavior, I think. And, and the more we look into the fossil record, I think we will continue to see that humans throughout this entire time period were acting 
essentially human behavior. And these other creatures, the Australopithecines, were not doing so. Which is an interesting problem for evolution because they somehow have to get from these Australopithecines who are um, non-human to us, right? So that's an interesting uh, challenge they have there. The development of the mind, since they would ignore the idea of the soul. And then also the development of tools and culture. So that's uh, an interesting challenge that they face. Hmm. Well, I'm kind of curious about the other challenges they might face. And, and I'm like, I'm thinking about, you know, for those who watch this, who already believe in evolution and they don't believe the Bible, but mm -hmm. you know, they, they watch this and they're like, see how much support there is for human evolution. What would, what would be your response to that? Do you think the things that you've shared today are good evidence for like humans evolving from these different in, in a progression? So I would bring, um, I would bring up several particular things, which I think are evidence of, um, a separate origin of humans. Um, one of those would be the, uh, those graphs I was showing you earlier, um, where you could see that humans end up as distinct from uh, these other creatures. And I think that's one way in which we can show that um, evolution would predict that there's just a seamless transition, right? We go from these basal ape-like ancestors all the way to humans. And because it happens so slowly over so many generations, we shouldn't even be able to tell what is human and what is not. And I think what that study showed is, no, we can actually tell what is human and what is not human. And I don't think it's quite as seamless as a transition as lots of people would like uh, there to be. I think we do, in fact, see discontinuity between groups. And this goes back to this whole discussion then. I like mm -hmm. to kind of phrase it, does classification equate to relation, right? So you classify two things together. Does that mean that they are related? And, you know, I'd have to say no, because yes, there are similarities, but I think there's many differences too. And creationists did in fact predict that. Uh, they predicted that we would find discontinuity between groups. And when we looked at the fossil record, uh, yeah, I mean, we could see, obviously there's differences between chimpanzees and humans, but when we look at all these uh, so-called intermediate species, in fact, we see them not go in this perfect transition, but instead group into these different uh, groups, which I think probably equate to the created kinds. Mm. And I think creationists have also predicted uh, that humans would exhibit practically modern behavior. I kind of talked about this in my debate with Erica and mentioned Neanderthals. Um, I mentioned that creationists have always predicted that all humans would exhibit essentially modern behavior in terms of, you know, being perfectly cognitive. Um, it, and, um, yeah, in the case of Neanderthals, they started out with a very bad idea surrounding them. One of those was Marcel and Boulle, who kind of uh, twisted what the fossils actually looked like and ended up with this huge, hairy beast, which we know today is just obviously incorrect. But a lot of evolutionary scientists at the time thought that Neanderthals were going to be more primitive, probably weren't very human-like in their behavior, but as we found ever since then, the more we find, the more human-like Neanderthals appear to be. Hmm. Okay, here's a question from Evidence and Reasons. Brian Thomas found dino bones with C14 dates of 23,000 to 35,000 years old. Do we have C14 dates for humans in that range? If so, that suggests humans and dinos lived at the same time and C14 needs calibrating. I believe we do have uh, we do have human fossils that have been dated at carbon 14 uh, between those time periods. Um, I mean, from their point of view, they're of course going to suggest that it's somehow contamination or they yeah, some type of error like that, which, yeah, no, that raises for me kind of the questions, you know, if, if, if that automatically is contamination and then how do we know the regular samples we're looking at aren't contamination, but that's a whole nother can of worms. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Um, did you have any final points that you wanted to make? 
Yeah, I, I think maybe I'll give kind of a, a summary of kind of what creationists believe about this all kind of. So okay. we, we start with Adam and Eve, right? We have this ancestral couple. Then we get to the flood where we have this population bottleneck. And we suddenly have just eight individuals on the ark, right? And then we get to the Tower of Babel. We have the diversification of humans over all the earth. They get all these unique separate traits. We have these different types and species of humans originate. And then for some reason, a lot of them die out. Some of them are absorbed into our population. And finally, we end up with us. And that's kind of how all those fit into kind of the creationist view. Some of these other species were probably ancestral to our own. Some lived in other areas of the world. And that's kind of exactly how uh, we would understand those from a creationist perspective. Awesome. This has been really wonderful. I, I hope everybody who's watched this has been imp as impressed with Peter as I am. This is, to me, incredible that uh, a high school student is this knowledgeable. So uh, thanks for your hard work, Peter. Thank you so much for having me on. It was great to have talk with you. And thank you to everyone who's been listening. Yeah, let's do it again. Bye, everyone.